Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing asthma and anti-asthmatic drugs. Okay, right. Uh, so in this video what we want to discuss is the pathophysiology of asthma in more detail than we previously discussed it. Okay, right. So as I said in the previous video, we are going to discuss this from the point that the adaptive immune response has occurred. Okay, so we're going to assume we now have CD4 positive T helper 2 cells, which have T cell receptors directed against epitopes of our allergen, and those have already been created, and we're now going to see how they're going to invade uh, the lamina propria of the bronchial wall, and how they're then going to cause this chronic inflammatory response that leads to airway hyperresponsiveness. Okay, right. So let's draw a picture, firstly, of uh, the inner portion of the bronchial wall. Okay, right. So I'll firstly draw some uh, bronchial epithelial cells here, which are columnar ciliated epithelial cells. So here are the columnar epithelial cells, and they'll have cilia here. Okay, and they'll be sitting on a basement membrane. So I'll put the basement membrane on. Okay, so I'm just drawing another picture, uh, more uh, zoomed in uh, than our previous one, of the inner portions of the uh, bronchial wall. So here we've got our epithelium, and then underneath that, of course, we'll have the lamina propria, which I'll just colour in in blue here. Okay, right. Now what's going to happen then in asthma is because of the chronic exposure to the allergens, you're continuously breathing in this allergen which you are launching an allergic adaptive immune response against, you are now going to get the recruitment into the lamina propria of these T helper 2 cells, which are CD4 positive T cells with T cell receptors directed against epitopes of your allergen. Okay, so, just so I've got a picture to point out when I need it, I'm going to draw a picture of the allergen here. So I'll just represent the allergen, whatever it might be, whatever the protein is that you're inhaling that is uh, causing this allergic adaptive immune response to. Okay, uh, we will colour this in purple. Okay, so this, is going, this box is going to represent our allergen. Okay, now, basically the T helper 2 cells that are going to be invading in here, these are going to have T cell receptors which will be directed against a certain epitope of that allergen. Okay, so here is a CD4 positive T cell. Okay, so this is our CD4 positive T helper 2 cell. And on this, its surface here we have the T cell receptor. And basically, T cell receptors recognize little fragments of proteins, okay? And the T cell receptors on the surface of these CD4 positive T helper 2 cells that are going to be invading the lamina propria uh, in uh, the bronchial vessels of this asthmatic person are going to be directed against some little fragment of this allergen, some little epitope, as we would call it, okay? A little portion of the allergen uh, which it's directed against, basically. Okay, and they are then going to recruit into uh, the lamina propria here. Okay, so you brought in these CD4 positive T helper 2 cells, and we'll come back to how these get activated and how you get so many of these cells later on. Okay, but for now, just accept that they have been activated against the allergen as part of the allergic adaptive immune response. Okay, and now the CD4 positive T helper 2 cells, and I probably should just say what CD4 positive means. Okay, they are going to have CD4 on their surface basically. So there's two main populations of T cells in the body there's the CD4 positive T cells, and then there's the CD8 positive T cells. Okay, CD4 positive T cells have CD4 on their surface. CD8 positive T cells have CD8 on their surface. No T cell has uh, both when it's mature, okay? In asthma, it's all going to be about CD4 positive T cells, so we're not going to talk about CD8 positive T cells at all. Okay, right. So you get these CD4 positive T 
T helper 2 cells, and T helper 2, TH2 here, refers to a specific type of helper T cell, and we'll come across this more later when we uh, discuss the uh, initiation of the adaptive immune response. But for now, just accept that this is a type of T cell that is coming in as part of this allergic adaptive immune response. Okay, now what do they do then? Okay, uh, well they secrete certain really important molecules called cytokines. Okay, so first thing, let me tell you about what a cytokine actually is. So a cytokine is any molecule which is released by an immune cell, okay, which a CD4 positive T helper 2 cell certainly is, which then goes on to act on other cells and affects the behavior of those other cells. Okay, so a cytokine is just a molecule released by an immune cell which goes off and affects the behavior of other cells. Okay, right, so the T helper 2 cells here are now going to start releasing three really important cytokines into the extracellular fluid of the lamina propria here, and I'll just label this up as the lamina propria here. Okay, right, so um, these three cytokines then that these T helper 2 cells are going to release are interleukin 4, a really notable one that T helper 2 cells release. Another really important one that T helper 2 cells release is interleukin 5 and then also interleukin 13. Okay, so the IL here stands for interleukin, okay, which means between white blood cells basically. Okay, so the fancy word for white blood cells is leukocytes. So interleukin between white blood cells. Okay, so it's a messenger molecule between white blood cells. Okay, and these four, sorry, these three interleukins here are all going to be incredibly important in the uh, pathogenesis of asthma. Okay, now we are going to throw interleukin-4 aside for the moment. Okay, interleukin-4 is going to be really important in helping uh, create uh, atopic asthma. Okay, so where you get the uh, production of uh, immunoglobulin E against the allergen, that's where interleukin-4 is going to be really important. But interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 are going to be really important in both atopic asthma and non-atopic asthma. Okay, and note at the moment we are discussing uh, the core pathophysiology. We're discussing what is true for both atopic and non-atopic asthma. We will come back and add on what in addition happens in atopic asthma later on. Okay, right. So in both atopic asthma and non-atopic asthma, CD4 positive T helper 2 cells directed against epitopes of your allergen are going to come into the lamina propria and they're going to start releasing these three important cytokines. Okay, right. Now, as I say, we're going to throw interleukin-4 aside for a moment and we now want to look at what does interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 do. Okay, well these are going to actually cause the chronic inflammation. Okay, we have so far brought into the lamina propria adaptive immune system cells. These are cells of the adaptive immune system. Okay, they're not cells of the innate immune system yet. Okay, so this isn't an inflammatory response yet. Inflammation is all about bringing in innate uh, immune system cells. Okay, so this is an adaptive immune system cell. Okay, uh, so now what's going to happen is interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 are now going to call for innate immune system cells to come into the lamina propria, and therefore they are going to trigger the inflammation. Okay, now which specific uh, innate immune system cell do they call for? Because there is a specific one that they absolutely love to call for, and it's eosinophils. Okay, so they are going to be responsible for causing what's called an airway eosinophilia. Okay, and an eosinophilia refers to loads and loads of eosinophils being recruited to a certain air, air area. Okay, so airway eosinophilia means that we're going to get loads of eosinophils recruited into uh, the airway. Specifically, they're going to be recruited into the lamina propria of the airway. Okay, so let's now discuss uh, eosinophils in a bit more detail. Okay, right. Uh, so, 
let's draw a picture of an eosinophil and what they look like. Uh, so eosinophils are classically a cell that is involved in fighting multicellular parasites. So for instance, multicellular parasitic worms are attacked by eosinophils. Okay, they are a very, very dangerous cell of the innate immune system. Okay, so that's an important thing. They're not part of the adaptive immune system, they're part of the innate immune system. Okay, so let me draw a picture then of an eosinophil. So, firstly, they have an odd-shaped nucleus. Okay, their nucleus is bilobed. Okay, now they don't have two nuclei. Don't confuse this for meaning that they have two nuclei. They have one nucleus. It's just got a really strange sh structure. Okay, where it's got these two lobes connected by this little um, tube here. Okay, right. So they have a bilobed nucleus. That's one of the identifying uh, features of an eosinophil. The other thing uh, which determines their name here is that they uh, love eosin. If you stain them with the dye eosin, they stain bright red. Okay, so eosin is a red dye. Okay, uh, and eosinophils take up loads of this red dye and therefore become extremely bright red and therefore uh, they're often compared to a sunglasses clad burnt face basically, sunburnt face. Okay, and you might be able to see why. Okay, right, so this is our picture of an eosinophil. Now the other important thing to say about eosinophils, uh, which regards their actual function, is that they are in the family of white blood cells that are called granulocytes. Okay, now the granulocyte family uh, contains eosinophils along with neutrophils and also with basophils. And these granulocytes uh, all contain a lot of granules, basically. They have vesicles containing products that they are capable of releasing. Okay, and I'm going to colour these in here in vivid purple. So these purple dots are representing the granules of the eosinophil here. Okay, now. How does the eosinophil function then? I've told you that it's important in attacking uh, the multicellular parasites that the body can become infected with. Well, basically what happens is eosinophils get on top of the multicellular parasite and then they degranulate. They release these granules onto the multicellular parasite and in these granules they have a bunch of cytotoxic proteins a bunch of really, really dangerous proteins that are capable of killing cells, basically. So let me now tell you about the cytotoxic proteins that eosinophils have within their granules. Okay, so these are extremely dangerous cells, basically. Uh, they can release a bunch of very, very dangerous proteins that are capable of uh, killing cells. Okay, and these are fantastic for getting rid of multicellular parasites, but of course we're now recruiting them into the lamina propria of our airway on the instruction of these misinformed T helper 2 cells here, and you can see that this probably is not going to end well. Okay, so uh, let me tell you about the cytotoxic proteins then that eosinophils have. So one of the main ones is called eosinophil uh, cationic protein, or ECP for short. So this stands for eosinophil, that's the E, and then the C is for cationic, okay, and the P is for protein. So eosinophil cationic protein. Another cytotoxic protein that they have is major basic protein, which is abbreviated to MBP. Okay, so the M stands for major, the B stands for basic, and the P stands for protein. That's another very powerful cytotoxic protein. Okay, uh, finally, they also have something called eosinophil derived neurotoxin, uh, which isn't usually abbreviated down, so it's just eosinophil derived neurotoxins. So these are three very powerful uh, cytotoxic proteins that are stored within eosinophil granules and therefore I will underline in vivid purple since they're in the purple granules here. Okay, and which can be released uh, by the eosinophils in a process known as degranulation. Okay, so when the eosinophils release these granules full of these horrible proteins, that's called degranulation. Okay, and uh, these proteins can then attack whatever they're released onto. 
Okay, and as I say, that's really, really important in attacking multicellular parasites. It's not so good if we're recruiting them into the lamina propria of our uh, airways, basically. Okay, right, but that's exactly what uh, the cytokines released by these t hub 2 cells are going to do, okay? Uh, so we've got our CD4 positive t hub 2 cell invading into the lamina propria because it's directed against some allergen that you're continuously breathing in. It's now giving out instructions in the form of these cytokines. We're ignoring interleukin-4 for the moment. We'll come back to what interleukin-4 does. It gives instructions to B cells. Uh, but interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 now give instructions to these very powerful cells of the innate immune system to start coming into the lamina propria. Okay, so the mechanisms of this are not fully understood, but what we do know is that if you have high interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 levels in uh, the extracellular fluid of the area, that causes eosinophils to accumulate there. That's the experimental fact that we know. How exactly interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 cause eosinophils to be recruited to that area, that's still not very well understood. But we know that when you have high interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 levels in an area, that causes eosinophils to accumulate there. And that's what's going to drive this airway eosinophilia. Okay, so, to draw another little picture then, I think I'll go on to a new sheet of papers to draw this next picture. Okay, so to draw another picture, let's draw our columnar epithelial cells here. Okay, so one, two, three, and then I'll put another one there. And they're ciliated, of course, so I'll just add some cilia on there. Okay, and they will be sitting on the basement membrane, and then underneath the basement membrane we'll now have our lamina propria, and now what we know is we've got these CD4 positive T helper 2 cells coming in. So here is our CD4 positive T helper 2 cell, okay, which I will just colour in in orange. Okay, and those are part of this adaptive allergic immune response against this allergen that you're being chronically exposed to. Okay, uh, so they will have a T cell receptor against an epitope of your allergen. Okay, and now they're going to be releasing these three awful cytokines, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. And now we know that what interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 is going to lead to is absolutely loads of eosinophils coming into um, the lamina propria, basically. Okay, so here they are. You now get loads of eosinophils in the lamina propria. Okay. Right, so that is what is meant by the chronic inflammation that you're going to get in the airways, okay? This chronic recruitment of these eosinophils, which are uh, this really deadly uh, cell of the innate immune system, into the lamina propria, that is what is meant by the chronic inflammation. So the T helper 2 cells are the allergic adaptive immune response, the eosinophils are the chronic inflammation. So in my original basic flow diagram, this is what I meant by chronic inflammation. Okay, right. So, interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 cause the accumulation of eosinophils in the lamina propria. Now what's going to happen, well you can probably guess what's going to happen now. The eosinophils are then activated to release their um, awful uh, cytotoxic proteins. And in fact, this is where interleukin-5 serves two functions. Not only does it serve to bring the eosinophils in in the first place, but it actually also actually activates the eosinophils to release their uh, horrors, basically, into the lamina propria. Okay, so the eosinophils are going to start degranulating and they're going to be releasing all of those cytotoxic proteins into the lamina propria. Okay, now not only... Uh, do they degranulate and release these cytotoxic proteins, but when they're activated by interleukin-5, they also uh, actually start releasing something called transforming growth factor beta, okay, TGF beta for short, and that's actually going to be really important in the uh, production of airway hyper-responsiveness. So this stands for transforming, that's the uh, T, and then it's transforming growth factor beta. Okay, and the important thing that you should take from that, if you're not totally familiar with what TGF beta is and what it does, is that it's a growth factor. Okay, it's going to make cells grow. 
OK, right. Uh, so TGF beta, which we'll underline in orange there. OK, right. Now, uh, before I talk about what TGF beta does, let's talk about what these cytotoxic proteins actually cause. And note, this is occurring chronically. OK, in people with asthma, this is what's occurring in their airways chronically, OK, to low levels. And this is what's going to be gradually causing damage to the airways, which leads to the airway hyper-responsiveness, which is then going to lead to uh, the asthmatic attacks being uh, caused. Okay, right. Uh, so the cytotoxic proteins released by the eosinophils, these are going to actually go and kill the epithelial cells. Okay, so these start killing epithelial cells, uh, the columnar epithelial cells here. These are the nearest cells by uh, where the eosinophils are coming in. Okay, so you're going to be starting to get uh, columnar epithelial cells starting to become very unhealthy and dying, basically. Okay, and one of the things that this causes is that it causes holes in the epithelium. Okay, so you're now going to get holes in the epithelium, and that's going to be really important in actually causing the airway hyperresponsiveness. Okay, in addition to directly producing holes in the airway epithelium, what also happens is as the uh, columnar epithelial cells get sicker and sicker because of these cytotoxic proteins, okay, as they get closer and closer to death, uh, they start releasing transforming growth factor beta as well. Okay, so you get more and more of this transforming growth factor beta being produced. Okay, right, so cytotoxic proteins result in holes in the epithelium, okay? They also result in more and more of this transforming growth factor beta being produced by those sick epithelial cells that are effectively being poisoned by the eosinophil uh, proteins. Okay, right. So we'll come back to how the holes are going to contribute to uh, airway hyperresponsiveness uh, in a moment. But for now, let's talk about what transforming growth factor beta is going to cause. Well, it's going to be acting on the uh, airway smooth muscle cells. Okay, so if I go back to my picture of the structure of the bronchial wall, here we have the lamina propria here. Underneath that, we have the airway smooth muscle cells. Okay, so we're going to start getting holes in the epithelial cells. We're also getting transforming growth factor beta going up and up and up. And this is going to go and work on the airway smooth muscle cells, basically. And it's going to trigger them to start hypertrophying and also uh, over dividing. Okay, so it causes them to undergo hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Okay, so I'll show this here. The transforming growth factor beta is going to go to the airway smooth muscle cell there, here. So here we now have a bronchial smooth muscle cell, which is in this spindle sort of shape here. Okay, and the transforming growth factor beta will act on transforming growth factor beta receptors on the surface of our bronchial smooth muscle cell. The details aren't important, but what happens is, and this causes first the hypertrophy of the bronchial smooth muscle cells, and now I regret showing the bronchial smooth muscle cells so big already. Okay, hypertrophy basically involves the smooth muscle cell getting bigger itself, basically. Okay, and I'm going to actually have to show this now, so I'm going to draw an even bigger one here now. So there we go, it's got bigger. Okay, so that's hypertrophy, that's one of the things that the transforming growth factor uh, beta is going to produce. Okay, it's also going to make the bronchial smooth muscle cells over-divide, and the fancy word for over-division is hyperplasia. Okay, uh, so the bronchial smooth muscle cells get bigger and they start over dividing as well. So you're going to be producing more bronchial smooth muscle cells. Okay, like so. Now, what's the overall consequence of this? Well, the overall consequence of this is that that bronchial smooth muscle cell layer that surrounds all of your bronchi is going to get thicker and thicker and thicker and more and more powerful, okay? Which means that its ability to contract and constrict the bronchus is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so what I mean by that is how narrow 
it can make the bronchi is going to be getting bigger and bigger basically okay because now you've got much more power in that uh, bronchial smooth muscle cell layer and therefore its ability to constrict the bronchus down is going to get greater if I show this on this picture, this is going to be getting thicker and thicker. So maybe previously it was capable of constricting the lumen down to maybe like that, and that was the maximum it could constrict it to. Now, once it's thicker, it will be able to constrict it even further. Okay, so the ability of the bronchial smooth muscles down there to actually constrict the airway has been uh, increased by this high level of transforming growth factor beta, which drives hypertrophy of the bronchial smooth muscle cells and also hyperplasia of the bronchial smooth muscle cells. Okay, now then, uh, the key things then that have happened here are that you've got the holes now in the epithelium of the uh, bronchial wall, and you've also got a much thicker. Uh, bronchial smooth muscle cell layer, okay, and these are the two key things then that cause airway hyperresponsiveness, AHR, okay. The holes in the epithelium, those are what now allow uh, cold air and noxious gases to actually cause bronchoconstriction, okay, so now they can gain access two cells that are in the lamina propria which can trigger the bronchoconstriction and we'll come on to those cells in a moment but I'll give you their name uh, now. Okay, so basically in the uh, lamina propria there are special cells called mast cells and these are the cells which can trigger bronchoconstriction. Okay, these are absolutely central to asthma. Okay, because these are the ones which coordinate the bronchoconstriction. They give the order for the smooth muscle cells to contract, basically. Okay, and they are present within the lamina propria. Okay, now mast cells can be activated by these uh, triggers of asthmatic attacks. So things like cold air, okay, or the noxious gases, these can activate mast cells to give uh, the order for bronchoconstriction. Now, if you've got holes in the epithelial lining, obviously it's going to be much more easy for cold air and noxious gases to trigger a response in the mast cells because now the mast cells are much more exposed, basically. Okay, that's part of what causes uh, the airway hyperresponsiveness. Then, in addition to that, we now have a, a bigger jurisdiction for the mast cells because we now have this thicker layer of bronchial smooth muscle cells. Okay, so when the mast cells give the instruction to the bronchial smooth muscle cells to contract and to bronchoconstrict, uh, now there are more bronchial smooth muscle cells listening to that order, okay, so you're now actually going to get a bigger bronchoconstriction than you would have ever got before, okay, so there is this, these two parts of airway hyperresponsiveness, okay, firstly, these stimuli are now able to gain access to the things which actually coordinate uh, the bronchoconstriction, and secondly, once these cells have actually decided that they're going to give the order for bronchoconstriction, there are more cells that are actually listening to that order, and therefore you get a bigger actual response. Okay, and that is all because of these eosinophils that are present within the lamina propria. I, it's all because of the chronic inflammatory response that is occurring in the walls of the uh, bronchi and bronchioles, which is due to the chronic allergic responses due to the presence of the T helper 2 cells. Okay, they are what fundamentally drives this entire process. Okay, right, so that's what occurs in both atopic and non-atopic asthma. Okay, now uh, let's turn our attention on to what actually occurs in addition in uh, atopic asthma, because remember in atopic asthma you produce this IgE uh, which is against the allergen, and that means that you're actually capable of initiating uh, asthmatic attacks in response to breathing in large amounts of the allergen, okay, which is something that you don't have in the non-atopic asthma. Okay, but we'll discuss what that difference is and uh, how the IgE is actually going to be involved in all of this in the next video.